My name is Robert Gay Schofield. And I'm Jason Harris. Our talk is titled Wolfram Player and Wolfram Engine for iOS. We work in the user interface department at Wolfram Research, and we are part of the team that built Wolfram Player for iOS. And so I'll be talking, uh, demonstrating the capabilities of the player, going through a lot of examples, zipping quickly through uh, its capabilities, and then... And then I will uh, give examples how to embed our uh, technology into your own iOS app. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Gay Schofield, and along with my colleague, Jason Harris, uh, we're going to talk today about uh, some iOS products. We both work in the user interface department, and we are part of the team that built the Wolfram Player for iOS. But we didn't just build the Player app. We built kind of a stack of technologies uh, that the Player app uses. And um, later on in the talk, I'm going to um, uh, go into details on how you can use the Wolfram engine uh, via our CDF kit SDK in your own iOS applications. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand it off to Jason, and he's going to give you uh, a run through the app itself. Right. Um, so, okay. So, I've got to make sure I leave enough time for Rob here. So, I'm just going to spin and zip through some of the some of the capabilities of the actual native player for iOS. Um, if you've been to uh, Nick and Parth's talk or um, Andre mentioned this previously. Uh, the, the Wolfram player now is at version 12.0. Uh, it's an entirely native and standalone application. It has a full Wolfram engine embedded in here. So it has all the capabilities you'd normally have on the desktop. Uh, it's, for, it's available for free on the App Store. Um, it costs $10 to unlock interactivity. And any notebooks that are signed, you can, you can fully interact with them. So let's go quickly zipping through some of the examples to, to fully illustrate uh, some of the capabilities. So in terms of typesetting, uh, I, along with Rob and parts of the team, have, have coded up a large bit of the, the algorithms for uh, typesetting. Um, and I can confirm that uh, a lot of the, the layout algorithms are, are very similar on the desktop and on this new core. And so, of course, we have you know, subscripts and superscripts and fraction boxes and square roots. And all the square roots there have, you know, they're nicely path drawn. The vinculums uh, are, are all lined up, you know, complements. You know, we have all the traditional form typesetting, uh, binomials and fractions and sums and styles. Um, and you know frames and uh, all the various different bits of frames. And here we have you know a, a grid box here. And um, I did the grid box, of course, uh, a lot of it in the the main desktop front end in an NB Lite. And here this this new core. And I can you know say uh, pretty definitively that the actual the version uh, in this new core is actually superior in, in many sort of regards. Um, and here's some examples of just you know the complete characters. You you know all the various symbols, arrows. Uh, characters is an illustration of them. Here's some template boxes for a traditional form typesetting and rotation boxes, and those are uh, working. Okay, so um, graphics, all 2D graphics. If for Yusu uh, has implemented a lot of these, and so you you know you can see a graphics of you know rasters, and here we see that you know the background on a particular plot changes. We've got you know the graphics primitives. We've got a circle. We've got you know uh, arcs and you know disks and wedges and graphics group boxes, uh, line boxes, polygon boxes, and you know Bezier boxes and all the other various 2D primitives. They're all fully implemented. Um, in terms of 3D graphics, uh, we've got it's actually kind of nice. You can you know set this thing sort of spinning and move it around. And with two fingers, you can actually sort of move this round into a, a sort of position. The controls are probably a little bit nicer than they are actually on desktop because you've got this two sort of finger, you know, we can pan that around and we can zoom it in and out and, and, and move it as we'd like. And of course, all the rest of, you know, parametric plots and, you know, some sector charts a la Bart and, uh, Bart, uh, a la Brett. Um, and so uh, Bart is a, a former team okay, member. So, yeah, and so, and of course, that's all built up in terms of the primitives. Here we see, you know, cones and, you know, cuboids um, and, you know, cylinders and geometric transformation boxes and graphics uh, group boxes um, and, Graphics group 3D boxes, complex boxes, line boxes, point clouds, polygons, uh, spheres, and two boxes. So basically, all 3D primitives are are included. Um, well, so uh, so there's a few things. The bleeding edge in the desktop, like surface appearance, is a new primitive with shaders and stuff. And so the, a lot of these things are then ported. Uh, we try and maintain parity with the desktop. And I'll talk about the, the differences in the versions in, in a second. Um, 
So uh, controls, of course, work. And you know, since it has a full kernel embedded in it, as you see the slider, you can't see my finger, but my finger is actually on top of the knob, uh, the, this, this, this little control right here. And so when I move this with my finger, I can't actually see it. I'm covering it up. And so for the iPad version, we have this nice little tooltip above that shows us what the value is. It's, it's kind of nice. Um, and we might even port this back to the desktop. It, it makes a nice sort of interaction there. And of course, checkboxes work. It's changing the value of that dynamic there. The pop-up menu here will change the value of that dynamic. The slider goes out of range. Here, the, if we change the x to minus 1, here it changes there, and, and so on. Um, we have setter bars. We'll change the values. Radio button, bar, radio button bars work. You know, locators, of course, you know, we can move this around. It has this nice little pop-up. Uh, color sliders do their thing. Uh, uh, action menu boxes. Uh, animators, we can speed that up a bit, make that bounce both ways, and, and so on. And so animators work. Uh, progress indicators. Uh, slider 2Ds. Uh, we can show and hide some axis there in terms of controls. Uh, input fields work, and we can type some stuff in. That's a non-continuous input field. So when I tap out of the input field or um, I hit enter, it'll commit the results. And of course, the continuous one works continuously, just like on the desktop. OK. Um, and so we have some, you know, here's a a tab view, we can change the position of the tabs, um, and hyperlinks work. And so we could go off here to the demonstrations website, um, you know, download this to the desktop, download it here on our, our device, get that, take a look at it, and uh, go view it in our player. Um, Apple's changed it, so we can't automatically just pop it open, but here we'd go, go and, you know, interact with this, you know, particular thing and, and see it. OK, so that gives a quick zipping through of controls. Um, I'd actually like to talk about manipulate here. And so here, let's, let's start off with, with some point out some bits to do with manipulate. Here's the simplest manipulate you can probably have. Um, and so uh, here we go. And it's manipulating 0 to x, um, 0 to 1. Uh, x goes to 0 to 1. And right now, you'll notice that the actual controls are placed down here. And we place the controls down here instead of on top of that, because if we'd place the controls in the normal way that we do on the desktop, we'd be covering the controls as we actually move our hand. And so um, <clears throat> it's nice to put them on this raft down the bottom. And of course, as we scroll out the, the manipulate off screen, it, it defocuses. And of course, we just can have multiple sorts of controls here. It's very nice and responsive. And here's another blob. We can you know, turn around and animate that um, and, and see it uh, animate nicely as it, as it moves around. Right. Um, and uh, of course, you know, these are all spinnable. And, and here's a more complex one. And, and it works just as, it, as you'd have on the desktop. You know, here's a, there's an X in there that's, you know, changing its perspective as we move it. OK. So um, I'd, I'd then like to move on to, of course, the iPad is usually a great device for consuming content. On, on, you know, there is some creation of it. People are trying to make it as a laptop, you know, substitute. But, but by and large, we, iPads or, or tablets or mobile devices are used for consuming content. So the natural target market is, uh, of course, um, documents like this book chapter by Eric Schultz uh, from Pearson. Um, and, and we use this during the development of, uh, you know, just to, to test all of our various features. And so, of course, in this book chapter, they'll explain various bits about, you know, line integrals here. And, you, and the student can click on it and take a look and go, oh, that's what a line integral sort of is. And, you know, show the surface and so on. And so this is probably a bit more of the target market uh, for, for, for students and other, you know, electronic books. Um, along with all of your other notebooks. And of course here, you know, he's got solutions to problems and notes and, and so on. And it, it's, it's, it's butter smooth in terms of its scrolling around. It, it's very fast and efficient. Okay. So um, I'd then like to actually point out, um, so this timer, how is this related? Does this mean we've only got 16 minutes left? So, well, okay, um, I better go faster. Um, so, <laughs> so, so um, the, the native app. Okay, so it, um, uh, we've, it, we've talked about opening, we've seen it in Nick and, and Parse talk about how to get documents on. You can get from, from your cloud account. Um, you know, back here there's a cloud account right over here, and you can see the various different things. You can go onto it and take a look. Um, and so we'll go back here to our display. Here. Um, so we can open documents from anywhere with email, iCloud, Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, side loading, and AirDrop. Right, quickly. Okay, so let me point out in particular that, that 
this is fully they're, they're, this is fully native, and it has a full Wolfram engine embedded in it. So the interaction between the front end and the kernel is instantaneous. You don't have to worry about any lag for network connectivity, and more importantly, we don't actually have to worry about any browser com compatibility. Does this work on Firefox? Does it look different on Chrome? And so on. And there's, there's a lot of things we can do natively that it's just sort of impossible to do on the browser. And this isn't detract from our, our cloud product. Jan and stuff have done an amazing job, but it's very difficult. And so when we have a native app, uh, we can do a lot of things that are are appropriate to the, the platform in, in, in better ways. Um, some things we've, we've made, so, so this is the, actually in launching it, I'll, I'll just sort of step forward, we've got this entirely new core. Um, and of course we can deploy it to different sort of platforms. One of these platforms is, is iOS. And so on the iOS version, we've actually made the, we've, we've done iOS specific things like, you know, our finger size touch targets are bigger. Some of the, some of the, they look a little bit bigger so you make sure they're not fat fingered and you can touch on them. We've got, you know, pinch to zoom as you've seen. The manipulate controls are in a different placement. And so here, here's just a few of the other ones. So we've added some stuff to the, this version of the kernel that's running on, on, this, on, on this device. Um, and one of those, oh, sorry, here, is uh, uh, touch position. And so, of course, you've got mouse position on the desktop, but we don't have a mouse. And so, as I put multiple fingers on here, you see multiple different sort of touches uh, that, are, that are going on. So, um, that's one thing. Another thing is the touch screen control placement. You'll see here in this manipulate, right here, this touch screen control placement goes on the right. So, we've put the actual, the, the, the raft of controls on the right. Um, so, that's, that's adapted for, for, for tablets. Um, and of course, I've mentioned sliders. You see this nice sort of tooltip that goes on top. One other thing that we've got is this uh, ghost slider. So you can sort of see there's two thumbs right there. And so it's kind of nice that the, 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 there's the main, the main thumb that the, the front end here, or our NB Lite, our player, uh, says it should be. But of course, the slider is one to three in steps of one. So it can only take the values in the kernel one, two, and three. Um, and so this ghost thumb shows where the kernel thinks the, the value is versus where the, the, the front end or the, the, our, our player sort of thinks it is. And so this is kind of nice. We originally put this in because we thought our, our version was going to be too slow on the iPad. It turns out it's actually a lot faster. We internally use in our formatting passes, we use these crypto hashes and Merkle trees, a little bit like blockchain, some really cool hip te te technologies. And it's actually highly dominated by the drawing speed, not actually our sort of formatting speed. So things are more efficient in this new core, um, and it's, it's, it's very fast. And so we've kept this ghost thumb around, and in fact, it's something we'll probably port back to the main uh, desktop as we go on. And of course, our locators here, as you see, it's got this nice little blow up. So of course, I'm covering it with my finger, and so um, we can see it nicely. Okay, so let's actually talk, and I'll mention here that this is a whole new core. Um, it took us quite a while. Uh, Rob originally started this effort. He worked in uh, the system layer, uh, system interface layer uh, on, the, on the main desktop. And so he designed this core. He started it off with uh, making the goal of making this core very transportable. And we can put it on different architectures, Android, Linux, Windows, Mac, uh, iOS, and whatever. And so we've built this core and the light that's, that's highly, it's very modern, hip, and cool, and uses, it's fully multi-threaded from the ground up. And of course, multi-threading is upon us. Um, if you take a look at, um, for instance, maybe $500 will buy a Ryzen now, which has got 12 cores, 24 threads, or uh, core Intel will buy you eight cores and, and 16 threads for a simple sort of desktop now. So uh, multi-threading is, is really in our, our wheelhouse. And happily, our, 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 our new core is fully multi-threaded. And let me just show you a demo of that. I'm gonna switch to a development player where I've turned on this feature called incomplete formatting. Um, and I'll just load up this notebook, this slow loading notebook. And you see it actually loads very fast. And right now, all these dynamics, which have got a pause of one, are actually filling in on all the various different multiple threads, and it just loaded the notebook up. And if I loaded this on a normal desktop, if Rob shows it later on, uh, you can see this will take 15 seconds, and it'll go line by line by line. And it just shows you the full multi-threading sort of nature uh, on, on this device in our core. OK, so if we go back to the native player here, and I've got to make sure I give Rob some time to speak. <laughs> um, so we've got this whole new core, and Rob is actually going to talk about the CDF kit of how it's actually sort of built. We've got this NB Lite, and we've got this kernel engine, and it's, the NB Lite has got these other sorts of cores. Um, the current limitations, of course, even saying that this is it's fully multi-threaded, um, it, it actually turns out that for parallel tools, Apple will, on the iPad, the player, it's nothing to do with the core, but on the restriction of this player, we're only allowed a single process instance space. So we were only allowed one kernel. When you quit this process, it quits the kernel as well. Um, and so we can't do parallel computation 
on this device. But of course, the core can do it, absolutely fine, or you can call out to other uh, remote kernels. Uh, saving, it's a player, so we don't save. Notebook programming, notebook get, note selection move, those kinds of things are, are uh, a work in progress. Um, some other uh, limitations. And of course, I'll mention, of course, the big one, Java, Apple says no on, on, on your iOS devices, so we need to have other, other techniques, and so we can use URL fetch and URL execute. Okay, I could, I could talk about some of the other features, but I, I need to leave Rob some time. I'll just mention, uh, you know, uh, side loading. This is a way to sort of get files onto your devices. And indeed, you can put a package that simulate peer-to-peer. -peer. Here's a package. I'm, I'm not going to go through and illustrate all the various bits. I'm just going to give you the summary. Uh, we, it's got local packages on here. We've got some sort of cloud connectivity. I can do some, I can load a package via the cloud. Um, I can, when do I load it? I can load it on first displaying it um, or via an initialization. And this application I'm just going to show you is uh, in peer-to-peer -peer lending very quickly. Normally in lending you've got a bank, but in peer-to-peer -peer lending you have no bank. You've just got a lender and borrowers. And so we, they micro-fractionalize a loan. So they might, this borrower might have lending $20,000, and each of these lenders lends like $5. And then over time, the borrower pays it back. Um, and you know, not all lenders have to, they might not like the color of uh, borrower's money, and so they might not do it. And so the idea is, of course, you've got no central organization, and if things financially collapse, you don't have run on banks and it's other sorts of bits. And we can go and visualize this. So the point of this is there's a package behind here. Uh, it's 400 lines of code, so it's not a one-liner but it's not you know, 20,000 lines of code, but we can actually put this all on and we can actually load this up on our device. And when I click on this, you'll just see quickly, it'll come up, it'll loading, 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 it loaded the package. So it loaded this package that simulate peer-to-peer -peer things and we can you know, select some grades of investments here and we can just sort of set it to running here and we can actually sort of see the whole, it illustrates a few things of actually having a complex package on, on our player um, and uh, selecting some grades. There's some persistence locally on the, on the device and we can do complicated things. Okay, I'm gonna have to then uh, move back to uh, handing off to Rob here. Um, let me just conclude uh, with uh, the summary uh, before Rob starts talking about CDF kit. So we have a fully native player for the iOS. It's a whole new engine. We can, and, and I guess the real challenge of our times now is since we've got these cool new features, we need to actually unify these with the desktop and we need to marry these together. And that's what we're engaged in of bringing back some of these new modern things that are uh, really very neat. Um, and this player is of course just one incantation of this. We have it you know, compiling, we've got a version of the front end uh, on the Macintosh which is using this core which is you know, different. Um, um, and we're continuing to flesh out the functionality and unification. So I'll hand it back to Rob uh, for talking about CDF kit. Thank you very much, Jason. So, uh, uh, right, so the, uh, the good news is that not only can you uh, benefit from our efforts in downloading the Wolfram Player app for iOS, uh, very soon uh, you will be able to embed that technology into your own iOS apps if you'd like to do so. We have this uh, product called Wolfram Engine uh, that is available, uh, and this uh, slide basically came straight from the wolfram.com slash engine website. Um, it's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux right now, and we hope very soon to have a fourth button up there that says iOS. Um, and what that is gonna do is it's uh, gonna uh, give you something you can download to your machine, and you can start a development project that includes our technology in an iOS app. Okay, so this diagram Jason showed earlier, uh, the player itself um, is a, kind of a, not the major part of all of this effort. The, the CDF kit that the player is built on top of um, is where we have uh, spent most of the time and effort in making this happen. And this is a framework uh, with an Objective-C interface, and we use that exact same interface in our player app that we're gonna make available um, to any of you. So when you download CDF Kit, you get something that looks like this. You get a couple of directories full of uh, frameworks to link against. There's some documentation, there's some example projects. So the first thing you do when you uh, want to build a project using CDF Kit, uh, there's a couple of project-wide changes you need to make um, in a new 
uh, Xcode project for iOS. Uh, first is you need to set your framework search path so it can find our frameworks. Next, you need to um, add some stuff here which uh, to the project. What this does is when you're building the project, it copies the frameworks to the correct location. This is something you only need to set up once and then you can completely forget about it and you can use this exact code right here. You don't need to write it yourself. Next, we have the classes of CDF Kit. The first thing we're gonna start with is something called CDF Session. This is just a, a basic singleton pattern from Objective-C or Swift if you've done iOS development. Uh, that should look very familiar. Um, nothing very complicated. Then, if you want to display notebook content in your app, there's two classes you need to look at. Uh, the first of which is called CDF Document and uh, with that class, you can create an empty file and change its contents at any point. You can load a file from disk. And then you pass that document on to CDF View Controller. And what that does is it takes the document and it creates a UI view for your iOS application that you can do whatever you want with. You can embed it in um, you know, your View Controller's UI view. You can have it take up the entire screen. You can have it take up a fraction of the screen. Um, and just to point out here, uh, there are various options you can pass to it. This one right here just enables scrolling. So there are some cases where you want your notebook content to fit a rectangular area, and some cases where you just want to display a notebook and have it scroll up and down. So as you've been seeing in the player app, uh, which I'm using at the moment, we have scrolling content. Uh, so this is the option that we use to get that. So in addition to displaying notebook content, you can also evaluate expressions using um, Wolfram language expressions using uh, Wolfram Engine. And the way you do that is you create um, objects of this type CDF expert. And there's a few different ways of doing that. You can create symbols and functions and integers uh, manually. You can have a string of text and parse those into an expression. And once you have an expression, uh, you can pass that off to an evaluator. And the evaluator takes the input expression, and at some point later, when that expression finishes, uh, it can optionally call a callback function um, to tell you that it's finished and tell you what the output of that expression is. Uh, so there are some cases where you don't really care about the output if you're just uh, using it to set x equals 5. Um, you don't care about the, uh, the output of that, so you can just ig ignore uh, the handler, and there are some cases where you want to be notified when the evaluation finishes. So let's just look at a few examples. Uh, these are in, included with the SDK. Uh, just to show you, it, it's not that much work to uh, create a new document, wrap a view controller around it, and then add it to your view. That's three lines of code. Um, and this is in Objective-C. The same code will work in Swift, uh, just accounting for the different syntaxes of the two languages. Um, so let's just take a, a quick look at this app, what it actually does. Uh, there are three views to pay attention to. One is the text field up at the top. This is basic um, iOS programming. There's a button over there. And then there's this big white rectangle, which is the CDF view. So when I hit the compute button, all it's going to do is evaluate the text um, that is in the input field, and then it will um, put the result of that in the notebook. So well, whatever. OK. So we can evaluate whatever we want. We can display whatever we want. Um, there are other cases, if we look at this one, for example. Um, that's strange. All right, a little problem there. This is kind of a more traditional iOS application with the, the master detail view. Uh, we have a, a list of um, salts. This was all data that was generated using Wolfram language code. I exported it to a file. I included that file with the app. Um, and so this is a graphics 3D box expression. 
that was generated using uh, Wolfram language code. And so whenever I just tap on one of these items on the left-hand side, um, it loads a 3D graphics box and displays it on the right-hand side. And then one other quick example I'll show is that um, this one, uh, the other examples were written in, in, in Objective-C. This one was written in Swift. Um, all it does is display a notebook um, that's included with the application bundle. Uh, but this is a very, very small amount of code in Swift that it takes to do that. Um, this is all of the CDF kit related code in that application. It's three lines. Load the document, create the view controller, add the sub view. So that's uh, all there is to that. Um, you think it would be worth showing the Xcode? Uh, yeah. Um, all of these, all of this code right here is included in the examples directory with the CDF kit, um, which we hope to make available for download as soon as possible. <laughs>